there was a time in our history when we listened to facts. If someone on the news or someone in the government gave us facts, we believed them. But that word today, facts, is almost a myth, isn't it? And whether it's political or medical right now, or in our health crisis, or our, our nation's politics, can you even come up with 10 good facts that we could all agree on? Probably not. It is so hard to know what is factual. I read it the other day. I, I saw it on TV. I heard it from someone who seems to be an authority. Science tells us. But so many facts have been twisted and manipulated and, and, and now we're at the point where we don't even know what to believe anymore. Except, except for this book right here. The book that has not changed for thousands of years. The book that is not twisted or altered to fit a political agenda. Well, this morning we're continuing in this book, and we're up to the, the in, in the book of Acts, we're up to Acts chapter 13. And Paul has been speaking to this little church in Pisidian Antioch, and he has been giving them facts. Not facts that are backed up by some, some technical research data. Not facts that have been run through an opinion poll. But facts that he himself has seen about what he himself has done and what he knows to be true. And for Paul to stand in this little church in the midst of a culture that is split politically and racially and he says, let me, let me tell you the truth. Let me give you the real, unvarnished truth. Let me just give you the facts that we've seen, that we've heard, that we've walked with. This is the promise of God. Oh, and let me tell you, it isn't temporary. And Paul begins by going back to the beginning, back to their beginning, to their ancestors and the history that has defined them. And this morning we catch up about halfway through that story. We covered the first half of it last week. And this week we dig into the rest of the facts. This morning I'm going to begin Acts chapter 13, starting at verse 32. Acts 13, verse 32. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. And so it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Do you hear that word being repeated over and over? Paul says, look, we can talk about our leadership right now. But you know what they're going to be? Decayed. Let me show you in our history. Our ancestors were in Israel were once under an incredible evil political system called Egypt. There was violence, abuse, oppressive slavery. You know where they are today? Decayed. God gave you prophets. Decayed. Priests. Decayed. Even kings like your great King David decayed. You know what doesn't decay? You know what is not temporary? You know what is eternal? You know what truth will never, ever change? This is why God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Because anything else in your life right now, your struggles, your worries, your hopes, whatever it is that that's, you're fearing, 
You know what it's going to be one day? Yeah, decay. Verse 38. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Not only are you forgiven, you're you're made right, you're found holy. This is something you can never get by trying to do good, by, by, by trying to be good, by reading more, by speaking more, by doing more of this and this and, and less of that. You cannot be found holy. You cannot be found right. The law of Moses can't do that. No religion can do that. No other religion could offer that. There's no money. There's no power. There's no social status. Because all of that is decay. It is. It always has been. It always will be the, Christ, the cross of Christ that frees you, that makes you right before God, that makes you holy in God's eyes. There is nothing else, period. Verse 40. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days you would never believe, even if someone told you. So that's his message. Beware if you hear this truth and you ignore it. Go ahead and scoff at it. Go ahead and mock it. Go ahead and do your own thing if that's what you choose to do. But this is the only truth you're going to get. And watch this. Verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. And they're like, oh man, you're, you're the greatest preacher we've ever had. Can you come back next week? Verse 43. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout... Let's go back one. There we go. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and the devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue. Circle, highlight, underline that word. Continue in the grace of God. Church, it's one thing to find the grace of God but it's another thing to continue in God's grace. Never, church, never just relax and go, you know what, I'm saved, I'm good. That's great. You have experienced God's grace, but are you continuing in it? Verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, and this is the Jewish leaders, when they saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying, and they heaped abuse on him. So the next Sabbath, the next week, everybody from the surrounding area comes to church. And now the church leaders are thinking, you know, I, it was okay to have this guy here for one weekend, but am I out of a job now? I've been serving here for nine years and the whole city has never turned out for me to preach. And now this new guy's getting all the attention and, and I'm wondering, do I even have a job anymore? And even among the people of God, there is bitter jealousy. Verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. He says, you know what? You can reject this. You can reject us. But you needed, we needed to make sure that you heard the truth. But if you want us to leave, that's cool. We'll we'll take this to anybody. We'll take this to everybody. Everybody that wants to hear. 
Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook off the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. They're kicked out of town. The Jewish leaders incite the prominent men and women to get rid of these guys. And so they leave Antioch and they're going to start making their way to this, this town that we call Galatia where we get the book of Galatians. But I want to take the last few minutes here and, and just kind of break this down because I truly believe that if this is what a divided culture and a divided society needed back then, oh church, it is what we need today. And last week, we looked at the first half of this message from Paul, and we came up with five reminders that we need to understand when we feel depressed and disappointed. And I put those on the back of your bulletin for you. We talked about God's plan, God's patience, God's power, God's promise, and God's salvation for us. And those are really important reminders when we look around and we see evil winning, evil prospering. Remember we talked about how easy it is to look at liars, liars and cheaters and people filled with deceit and hatred and yet we see them prospering. No accountability. No punishment. Where's the justice for those who choose to do right and live good, clean, moral lives? And it is so easy to get depressed and feel like, why am I even doing this? Why am I trying to live right when these guys get away with whatever they want to do? We look around it at what's going on in Washington or, or even Boise, and it's so easy to get upset about what's going on. And so last week I gave you some things to hang on to, things to, to remind us who is truly in control and who is truly eternal. And this week I want to add to that list with a few more reminders that we just need to hold on to when we, when we are struggling. So last week I gave you one through five. This week we start at number six. Always remember this, church. God's plan is bigger than our politics and our problems. God's plan is bigger than our politics God's plan is bigger than our problems. I'm not saying that, that politics and problems aren't important. They are. I'm not saying they don't count. They do. I'm not saying they don't matter. Of course they are. They, they're, they're right there in front of us. Our problems and our politics form and shape so much of how we live our lives and what we're going through. But we cannot focus on problems or politics because they're temporary they're decaying they're not eternal I don't care whether our governor or our president or our senators are red or blue it is important and I'm gonna pay attention and I'm gonna vote but it doesn't matter eternally important yes eternal no I don't know what's going on with this virus mess, this COVID thing. I don't know what the real facts are and, and where the real truth comes from. But I do know this. It is not eternal. I don't know what you're facing right now, financially, economically, a relationship, I don't know what your challenges are spiritually, what your challenges are health-wise, health but all of this is decay. 
And I love that Paul just stands in this church in, in Antioch, in Pisidian Antioch, and he says, let me tell you, even the hardest times in your history, from your Roman slavery to your Egyptian slavery, from the time that your ancestors wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, temporary, temporary, temporary. You need to come back and focus on God's plan, God's patience. God's power, God's promise to us, and God's salvation for us. And now you need to remember that God's plan is greater than your problems and your politics. You want to kick us out of your city? That's fine. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. You want to tell us we can never come back here? That's fine. We will go with joy I love the way James 4 says it. James 4.13 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow is going to bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Isn't that good? Jesus says, what's, uh, James says, What's consuming you right now? What is it that's worrying you right now? What is it that's troubling you right now? The economy, your world, your work. Can I remind you who you are? James says, can I remind you? That's you right there. You go to school, you go to college, you get married, you die. That was you, a vapor. You smell good, but you're going to be gone in a few minutes. Where are you, King David? You know where King David is? There he is right there. Where's your greatest problem in slavery? Yep, there it is. Where's your greatest problem in government? Yep, right there. Gone. James goes, you know what hasn't decayed? God's plan. God's power. God's purpose. God's promise. God's salvation for us and therefore the purpose of you being forgiven and justified for your life Paul takes two pages out of the book of Acts and says don't focus on that that's not you yes there are real issues yes those are real hurts But those are temporary. Christians, we need to roll up our sleeves and be involved. But we've got to remember, where does our joy come from? Where does our hope come from? It's not from that vest or that vapor. It's from right there. God's plan is so much bigger, so much bigger than our problems. So much bigger than our politics. Number seven on our list create opportunities not conflict I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've dwelt on this over and over again in the book of Acts we saw a man named Philip remember how he went chasing after an Ethiopian eunuch and he and he simply walked with him and created the opportunity to be heard and Jesus when he talked he never went in and started teaching without earning the right to be heard he cured he helped he healed. And we're going to see over and over again in the next few weeks and months, Paul and Barnabas are continually going to create opportunities, not conflict. My friends, people right now need good news. They don't need garbage. There's enough of that in their life already. And I love that even in this synagogue, in the, in the hills up in Pisidian Antioch, they come up to Paul and they say, Paul, have you got any good words of encouragement for us? Do you have anything encouraging that we can hang on to right now? Because there's so much conviction and there's so much hatred. There's so much angst and and anger out there. We need something positive to focus on. And so Paul fills the people so much that, that they beg him, please, can you come back next Sunday? And the next week they bring their friends. They bring their family. They bring their neighbors, their countrymen, people who desperately need to hear the truth. The truth that encourages, not the truth that that discourages. And isn't it hard to hold on to truth these days? Our culture is changing so quickly 
so rapidly that right now when it comes to truth, do you re- did you realize that when our U.S. Constitution was adopted, that one of the qualifications you had to meet in order to hold public office was you had to make a public profession of faith. The state of Delaware, in its constitution, required government officials to, quote, profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, His only Son and Holy Ghost, period. Required. And only a hundred years ago, our Supreme Court unanimously, unanimously upheld and said that we need to teach the Word of God in our schools. The case of Vidal versus Girard's ex- executors. Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story wrote these words The Bible, and especially the New Testament, shall be read and taught as divine revelation in all schools. Its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. And he continued with these words. Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? This was a unanimous decision by our Supreme Court. And yet 100 years later, by the end of the 1900s, we can't even have the Ten Commandments up anywhere. We can't have manger scenes in public display And even just in my own lifetime, when I was growing up, the Word of God was something to be held on to, something that that most Americans held to be true. The Bible was something that was was accepted and upheld, and, and yet by the time I'm a teenager, the Bible was something that, well, it was permitted, but you were just different. You could carry a Bible with you to school, but you were different. And then somehow... It became wrong. Society has just decided that it's wrong. I don't care what the Bible says about sexuality. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what your Bible says about killing unborn children. Your Bible is wrong. And quickly the truth has become hateful. Hateful. How dare you even teach our children that there are only two genders? How dare you teach our children that marriage is between a man and a woman? That's hateful. People, I don't know where this goes. In the next 20 years, I hope I'm here. But what is the truth? How are people going to see it? And Paul says, here is what people need. They needed it back then. Oh, Lord, we need it today. Paul didn't focus on Rome. Paul didn't focus on the state of the broken government and how messed up it was. Paul didn't even focus on the persecution. He said, the answer is Jesus. You may see that as different. You may see that as hateful. You might see that as unacceptable. He said, that decision is up to you. But my decision as a Christ follower is simple. We present the truth. It is encouragement for a hurting world. It is a blessing to some who believe. It is convicting to some who refuse to. But it is always the truth. And the eighth thing that we need today is a final reminder. Never lose our eternal vision. How does our story end today? They're opposed They're kicked out of town, and they're told not to come back. And yet, what does the last verse of chapter 13 say? It says, the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. What? They had spent two weekends there, maybe eight, nine, maybe ten days. And they're kicked out of town, and yet they go, man, this was awesome. Why? Why? Because they weren't focused on what was happening right in front of them. They weren't focused on the temporary. They were focused on the eternal. Friends, we must never, ever, ever lose our eternal vision. If Paul and Barnabas were concerned only about making a dent in in, in politics, 
if they were concerned only about making a dent in, in racial tensions, if they were only concerned about making a dent in the city and the government, if they were only focused on culture and, and acceptance and outcome, they would have thrown in the towel. Forget it, this ain't working. We couldn't even last longer than a week here and we get kicked out of town. We're out of here, I'm done. This was a terrible idea. But they said, no, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy. Why? Because their focus wasn't on what was happening right there. Their focus was eternal. So how do we get that? How do we hold on to that? How do we keep an eternal focus when we look around and we see everything's falling apart? How do we keep an eternal focus when, when everywhere we see evil winning and, and, and wrong being called right? And I want you to remember that homework that I gave you last week. Remember Psalm 73? Did you do it? I went to Psalm 73 when I struggled, when I needed help, when I needed some encouragement. And it reminded me that all this, all this is only temporary. The wicked white win for now. There it goes. The evil might prosper for now. Phew, gone. People are hurting for now. That's it. Church, I've said it so many times. I'm going to say it again. There is so much more to us than here and now. We are more than just that. We are eternal, and we have to focus on something greater than that right there. I closed last week with this idea. I'm going to close with it again. My biggest takeaway from Psalm 73, the thing I hang on to the most when I need it, just a few simple words, but oh, so powerful. As for me, it's good to be near God. I love that. That's my focus. When the world around me is falling apart, I have to remember God alone is my refuge and my strength. If I put my hope in our government, if I put my hope in election process, if I put my hope in my security and my finances and my health, they're all decay. As for me, it is good to be near God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for forgiveness. God, may this be a week where you teach us to walk with you in your grace. Not to focus on others. We're going to get disappointed. Not to focus on ourselves. We're going to be depressed. Father, help us to focus on you, on your truths and your promises. It is in you we find encouragement. It is in you we find our strength and our delight. May this be a week that we draw closer to you. And may we find strength in you for each new day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being here today. Please come back next Sunday. But in the meantime, go out there and find someone who needs encouragement, someone who's hurting, someone who's struggling. Don't look around. Don't look within. Look up. And when you find them, share them, share with them the hope and the joy that you have. It's eternal. God bless you.